Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Monday, October 14th, 2019. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Hope you were able to go worship our Lord and Savior somewhere. Anyway, let's get right into it. Out of Business Insider. Headline says, Disaster is unfolding in Syria as videos emerge of U.S. allies being slaughtered and hundreds of ISIS prisoners escape during airstrikes. As the Turkish invasion in northern Syria proceeds, the region appears to have descended into violent chaos, with videos emerging of Turkish proxies slaughtering U.S. allies. Some 700 women and children with links to the terrorist group ISIS left a Kurdish-run detention camp after a Turkish airstrike nearby prompted about 13,000 people, mostly displaced refugees, to flee. This Turkish invasion began shortly after President Donald Trump announced U.S. troops would be repositioning away from Kurdish forces, who have been U.S. allies in the fight against ISIS. This Turkish invasion in northern Syria continues its fifth day now after President Trump announced U.S. forces would be moving out of the region. U.S. official said Sunday that the campaign to defeat the terrorist group ISIS in Syria was over for now and that ISIS has a second lease on life with nearly 100,000 people who will rejoin their jihad. The official added that U.S. policy has failed. You know... Sometimes you just need to finish the fight. Finish the fight. Walk away victorious. Just a thought. Out of AP News, Syria's Kurds look to Assad for protection after U.S. pullout. Syria's Kurds said Syrian government forces agreed yesterday to help them fend off Turkey's invasion a major shift in alliances that came after President Donald Trump ordered all U.S. troops withdrawn from the northern border area amid the rapidly deepening chaos. This could lead to Turkey and Syria having some clashes between them. It kind of adds another name to the group of possibilities concerning Isaiah 17.1, the destruction of Damascus, where Damascus becomes a ruinous heap ceases to exist as a city, Isaiah tells us. I've thought for years it would probably be Israel causing that to come to pass. Could be America. Thought it could be Bashar al-Assad himself because he said in the beginning of that Syrian war, hey, if it looks like our forces are about to fall, I'm going to launch every rocket against every enemy we have. Now it looks like Turkey could be the one to cause Isaiah 17.1 to come to pass. Who knows? Stay tuned. Keep watching and praying, I guess, because we will eventually find out. Can I just ask if anyone else is tired of the way our government is run here in America? For the past three years, I haven't seen Congress or the Democrats do one thing useful or helpful for we, the people. What have they done for us? The only thing they've done is fight against the president that we elected because they disagree with him. All they've done is try to get him kicked out of office one way or another with some made-up scandal after another. What have they done for America? Have they done anything they were elected to do? The only one, it seems, who's keeping any campaign promises is the one they're trying to get rid of. I'm so tired of hearing Beto O'Rourke saying, Heck yeah, we're going to come take your guns. No, you're not. Not taking mine. Good luck. Telling me, oh yeah, everybody should be required to pay for abortion. Nope, I'm not. I disagree with it. What you do with my money is up to you. That blood's on your hands, not mine. Now O'Rourke says churches that are opposed to same-sex marriage should lose tax-exempt status. 
people, these are the kind of people that are running for presidency in this country. We've already heard Joe Biden say, oh, he's going to elevate the LGBTQ community by pressing this Equality Act, which isn't equal at all. There's more and more of these people who are attacking our biblical beliefs, attacking churches, saying, oh, if you don't agree with same-sex marriage, you're going to lose your tax-exempt status. Really? So you're willing to violate the separation of church and state for your own agenda? Of course they are. The double hypocrisy, the double standards of the Democrats is just mind-boggling. You know, uh, Booker is saying, oh yeah, there should be uh, gun, gun laws and anyone buying a gun should have proper ID and this and that. And then he says, oh, but vote, voter ID is racist. <laughs> Wait, which is it? It's either a good thing or it's a bad thing. Which is it? Can't be both. Any church opposed to same-sex marriage should lose their tax-exempt status. This is a government official running for presidency of America. I shudder to think what would happen if a man like this fraud ever got into office. He'd come after our guns. He'd force us all to pay for abortions. He would tell everybody LGBTQ people have better and greater rights than anyone else. And if you believe the Bible, you're going to be punished. Right here in good old U.S. of A. I don't recognize my country. I can't fathom the depravity, the incredible lost status of so many people who are so following after the devil, yet they think they're doing good. It, it, it's mind-boggling. It's, it's really amazing to watch. You know, I, I've, I've been reading the Bible for more than 50 years. My mom and dad gave me a Bible when I was three. <laughs> um, I've been reading it for quite some time. I can remember reading as a kid that all the nations of the world would be gathered together against Israel. And I thought, not America, not us. We're Israel's friend. We love Israel. Israel loves us. We take care of each other. You know, and I used to, as a kid, and when I'd read passages like, Israel was protected by the wings of a great eagle for three and a half years, I thought, surely that's America, protecting Israel. I thought, man, how could that ever happen to where America goes against Israel? Yet, if people like this guy are in office, it would easily happen. Now, just because America's government and the leadership of this country goes after them doesn't mean that we all go after them. I don't care who's in office. I don't care who's trying to run the country. Christ is still king. And the word of God is still more important than any word of any man. Period. Period. I will never give in on my convictions, the things I know to be true. No matter who's in office. Gay marriage is wrong. It goes against what God says. It's a sin, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not. It's a sin, just like adultery is a sin, just like murder is a sin, just like... Pride's a sin, just like stealing is a sin. Homosexuality is a sin. And to threaten the churches by taking away their tax-exempt status. I'm sorry, there's got to be a special place in hell made for somebody like that. I pity the man. Let's talk about what it means to be a born-again believer. In Romans 6, verse 4, it says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. 
You know, it was Jesus himself. In John 3, um, starting in verse 5, Actually, John 3, verse 3, Jesus answered, said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Being born again. In John 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. You must be born again. You know, I can remember throughout my life, uh, you know, when I was in high school, I, I, knew, I knew some very avid church-going people. Um, I'd seen people that were in church every Sunday, every Wednesday night, if the doors were open, they were there, you know, always singing, always praising, always giving. There were times where I would, would talk to some of these people, you know, and, and there were times when I'd say, you know, what do you think it means to be born again? They're like, what? I, I, I've never heard of that. What's that? And I'm thinking, really? Do you just show up and, and stand here thinking because you do so you're saved? I mean, I've... I've had decades of interesting conversations with people about salvation, about the Bible, about end times, about all kinds of things. Um, and I think it's sad because a lot of people grow up in the church, but they never hear the message of the new birth in Jesus Christ. They never hear that you must be born again. They're too busy listening to, oh, God wants you to be a millionaire. He wants you to have a Mercedes and a mansion and this and that and Hmm. You know, and it's not just a select few people that feel that way. I think it's happening all over. People grow up in the church, they sit through the service, but they never hear what it means to be born again. They never hear that Christ died for your sins. They never hear that you are raised into the newness of life in Christ. You know, being born again isn't something the Baptist made up or just one group of people believe. It's a reality for those who have truly experienced salvation in Jesus Christ. Christ himself said it. You must be born again. Hmm. It, it means a new way of seeing others. It means a new way of thinking about sin. It means a new way of understanding who you are in Christ. You know, when you come to Christ, you're made new. And, and that has so many implications for every area of your life. You love others, and you, you desire to see them giving their lives to Christ. You want to see them repent of their sins and ask Jesus Christ into their life. You hate the sin in your own life. And you want to be transformed in how you live. You want God to mold you and make you and shape you into the image of his son, Jesus. You yield yourself to God. You see yourself as God's servant. And you seek to serve him with your life. <laughs> I think that's what it means to have a new life. We need to live that out. When I was a younger man in my 20s, I, I felt the call of God on my life. But it was the 80s, and I was like Jonah. I just kind of turned and ran. I thought, who am I to tell others about Christ? Look how I'm living. You know, the 80s were all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and I was deeply immersed in all of it. But like the prodigal son, I returned home. I came back and God welcomed me with open arms. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you felt that in your life. Maybe you're going through that now. I can say without a doubt, 
of all the things that I do in my life, sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with others is by far the most important. We need to seek after God's wisdom. We need to seek after his truth. Matthew 23, verse 1, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. If you keep reading in Matthew 23, this, this was a, rebu a rebuke by Jesus to the scribes and the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy. It was probably the, the harshest treatment that he ever gave to any group of people ever in Scripture. And he did this publicly before all the people the people the hypocrites most wanted to impress. I keep thinking, Jesus, what would you say to the Democrats today? You know, Jesus had faced a lot of battles before this, this public rebuke of the scribes and Pharisees, but on this day, this, this encounter started with the chief priests and the elders challenging the authority of Jesus. You know, Jesus stunned them when he replied with a question that challenged their authority. And then he used three parables to illustrate that the leaders of the Jews had rejected the rule of God in their lives, despite their pious religious acts. And it's funny because it says, they perceived that he spake of them. <laughs> oh, well, duh. Yeah, he was. He's talking right to your face and you could barely perceive he was speaking of you. And then the Pharisees countered by trying to tempt Jesus with a question about paying taxes to the Roman government. Then the Sadducees tried to stop Jesus with a question about the resurrection. And then finally, that rich young uh, ruler tried to uh, snare him about a question about the greatest commandment. They were all trying to trap him. Jesus then asked the leaders who were supposed to know it all a question that none of them could answer. These Jews who prided themselves on having superior knowledge. They were totally humiliated by a man who had never been through their religious seminary of their day. This resulted in them being afraid to ever try to trap Jesus again by asking him questions. These were the events of the day that led up to Jesus and that stinging public rebuke of these hypocrites. Jesus gave this rebuke publicly, knowing full well they were planning to kill him. My Savior was totally fearless in the face of their threats. They didn't bother him with their chatter, with their words, with their hypocrisy, with their double standards. All these questions were intended to try to snare Jesus, to trap him. But in his infinite superior wisdom, he evaded their traps we need to ask God for this wisdom so he can help us evade traps, so he can help us overcome those who seek to stop us, those who seek to tell us to stop telling others about Jesus Christ. We need to let the peace of Jesus rule in our hearts. In Colossians, Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Hmm. Peace of God, rule in your hearts. You know, I think that's something everyone wants, this, this sense of inner peace. I was watching something on TV last night. I was dead dog tired and just ready for bed, but I was watching something and they were talking about these tests they were doing on people with these, uh, I forgot what kind of, some kind of psychotic drug they were using on people. And this lady who was anxious all her life and had these anxiety attacks, she was like, oh, it was just so peaceful 
and beautiful and I'm no longer afraid. And I'm thinking, you know, that's not really what you need. You really need Christ in your life. People want this inner peace. A lot of people think it only comes when the circumstances in their life are good and pleasant and enjoyable. But for those who follow after Christ, God's peace is available when nothing around us is calm or in order. In the midst of chaos, a follower of Christ can have inner peace. This verse I read shows us a few truths regarding the peace of Christ. I mean, we're given a command, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That's to say that we can play a role in whether or not we experience his peace. I mean, anytime we're given a command in Scripture, we can count on God to enable us to obey it. But at the same time, you can choose to ignore it. Christ's peace is capable of ruling in our heart. The word rule means to act as arbiter. An arbiter is a person who has the ability or the authority to decide a dispute. When doubts or worries come about, the peace of Christ reminds us of God's truth, which has the power to quiet our heart and our mind and renew our trust in him. This amazing peace also overflows into our relationships in the body of Christ so that we can live peacefully and in harmony with others. And I think gratitude is a very important part of peace, being thankful. You know, thankfulness is a result of remembering all of God's benefits instead of dwelling on the circumstances in our lives that rob us of the peace we're seeking. You know, counting our blessings in this way ensures the rule of Christ's peace in our life. We don't have to let our concerns and our troubles and our worries cause us all this unrest. The peace of Christ, which is available no matter what you're going through, can strengthen your confidence and your trust in Him. So lean upon the Prince of Peace and trust Him as you go about your day, as you see those who try to cause turmoil and chaos in your life, those that you read about in the news or hear about and you get agitated when you hear what they're saying. Let the peace of Christ rule in your life. And let's trust God's Word. And you know what? No matter what all these liars say, no matter what all these godless people want to demand or respect, uh, expect of you. Let's stay grounded in the word. I've said it before, people. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Keep seeking after Christ. Keep your focus on Christ. Stay in the word. And understand that these godless people will get their full reward. And so will you. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again tomorrow.